Good evening all, and welcome. Today's video has been graciously sponsored by The Ridge Wallet. They were very kind to send me one of these beauties, and even though it's not a word I typically use to define a wallet, its elegance and simplicity really speaks for itself. For too long have I been hefting around my thick leather wallet, and now that I have the Ridge Wallet, it's changed the feel of my pocket completely. I guess I never really noticed how bulky and in the way it was until now. It's great, all you do is just slot your cards in and put your cash in your money strap. It's literally changed my life. And that's it, you're all set. There's no need for anything else. It's super durable and comes with a lifetime guarantee. So if you're interested in getting one of your very own, or for someone else, be sure to punch in the promo code MORTIS for 10% off. The link can be found in the description. So go on, liberate your pockets today. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. This happened about three years ago. My best friend and I grew up in a sleepy, wannabe New Jersey, Central Florida town, and we were the outcasts. We had met in sixth grade when I'd overheard her talking to another classmate about Bionicles my 11 year old self's passion. We became fast friends and soon were inseparable. Soon began the gauntlet of sleepovers, birthday parties and family gatherings. We were practically siblings. She was the first person I came out as bisexual to. And in turn, I was the first person she told about being trans. Her home life was tumulus, though I can't say mine was any better. We often had the habit of taking refuge in each other's houses. Like I said, we became like siblings. Her father was an alcoholic, strict, and prone to physical discipline. Her sister was a stuck up girl who soon gravitated towards the hicks and jocks when she entered high school. And her mother was a pseudo vegan hippie love child held over from the 80s. When I was 23, Herself, 22 at the time, we had another long night of sleepovers in order to let her escape yet another fight with her mother. She'd recently lost her job at Walmart and I was going into my first shift at a Taco Bell the next day. On the drive home the next morning, she excitedly told me that since she now had her own vehicle, she would be applying at pizza places that were in need of a driver. I was proud. It was the first time she'd ever hunted for a job on her own, and I'd usually be the one to coax her to apply where I was working. Not that she ever lasted very long. My first training day goes by quite well. My co-workers are friendly and try to get me to talk more. My manager likes to playfully embarrass me, a fat white guy, by trying to get me to talk hood to the other workers. Being a training day, it wasn't a very long shift, but I'd gotten up early in anticipation, and this was my first day on the job in a few months. I got home around noon, informed some of my internet friends that my first day went well, and around 5pm I started to bed down. Drained from a good day. As I'm preparing to lay in my bed, I get a stream message, her lamenting another fight with her mother, and asking if she can come over. I'd started to grow a bit wary of the fights on their end. I had begun to repair my relationship with my family and a few friends, and I had given her advice many times on how to better approach things. In my infinite wisdom and eagerness to sleep, I left the message on read and drifted off into slumber. Around 8 p.m., I am awakened by her bursting into my room in a panic. Having just been ripped from a dream, I'm groggy and disoriented, and I drag myself to the bathroom to relieve my bladder and come back into the room to find her rocking back and forth on my bed. That's when I notice she's covered in blood. She informs me that she just saw someone murder her mother with a knife. My mind goes blank. In the deepest parts of my mind, alarm bells start ringing. Isn't the rocking back and forth a bit overdramatic? Why didn't she call the police? But this is my best friend. I've known her for over a decade and we were the only two people in the world we would count on. I suppress it and go to inform my sister and stepfather. 
My mother had passed away the year of prior, and it was roughly a month to the anniversary of her death. We were all in a dark place, antisocial as always, and it was the only way we knew how to handle emotional issues. When I inform my family, they immediately go to the same place I had, though they are far more vocal about it. I offer excuses that I knew myself were flimsy. And so then I returned to the room with phone in hand. I convinced her to call the cops, and I can hear her explain the details over the phone, a man in a black ski mask. And when the cops arrive, she swears up and down that it's most likely her father. They send cars over to check the crime scene and take her in for a statement. I ride with her in the back of the cop car over to the sheriff's office. It gets to be around 2 a.m. Her sister was brought in, as was her father. I have work the next morning and request to be taken home by a police officer. It takes me a while to go to sleep that morning, and the next day at work I'm quiet until my manager asks me what happened. I inform him, but decided to work the rest of my training shift. When I get home, my sister informed me she confessed. Her mother threatened to kick her out for not being able to find a job, and in a rage, she had taken the kitchen knife and done what you know to her mother. My mind froze like a bad computer, and I turned to face my monitor. I was in a Discord call at the time, and all I could weakly say is, my best friend confessed to murdering her mother, before hanging up and laying on my bed. Her last trial was the 7th of this month. I don't know the result, though my grandmother tells me she took a plea deal for life in prison rather than the death penalty. Part of me wants to contest that, to demand that they take the death penalty for ridding the earth of such a peaceful and caring woman. A large part of me is glad she's being punished. Natalie, you are my best friend, my sister, and my platonic soulmate. But please, let's never meet again. There was this one time that I was out on a date with a girl. We did a happy hour dining thing that went well, so we wanted to keep things going. There were a decent number of red flags flying, chief among them being that her ex was a one percenter in a local biking gang and was in prison. But she was hot and I'm an idiot, so we wandered down the street to her favourite bar. At that point, she's a full-on social butterfly, wandering the bar chatting to all the regulars, so instead of following her around like a puppy dog, I just saddle up to the bar and start talking to the group of guys next to me. Very nice dudes, very chatty and amiable. Eventually, a number of bikers pull up. Now I'm a bit concerned and ask my new friends if everything's cool, since I told them my situation. They reassure me everything's fine and I'm welcome there. Maybe an hour later, I wander off to the bathroom, come back, and the dudes tell me in a concerned tone that I need to leave now. To this day, I have no idea what happened, but there was no mistaking the urgency of their tone. So I promptly paid my tab and headed to my car. I hadn't seen my date in a while, so I was a bit surprised when she came running out the bar, jumped into the passenger seat and just yelled, drive. No high speed chase or anything after that. But let's just say I was a bit freaked out. She was mostly incoherent at that point. I took her back to her place and we got there and she tried getting freaky with me in the car. After the night's events and with her being wasted, I gave the whole situation a hard pass. She started crying. Then in short, order puking out of my door. It kind of goes without saying there was no second date. My sense of self-preservation kind of outweighed my curiosity at that point. When I was 15, a friend and I went for a lot of walks around town, a small town with about five to 6,000 people living there. We were going to this cyber cafe in town to meet a few friends, and we often took different streets to get to places, just to keep it interesting. We were about to go onto the main street off one of the side streets, and a man on a bicycle approached us. He got off his bike and asked us a few small talk questions. Something didn't seem right about him. He was probably mid forties, and we both kept inching away, but didn't want to come off as too rude. 
So we answered about the weather or traffic. Then he paused and said we had to go. And I said, and I'll never forget. You look so young. I don't want to get in trouble. But I need to touch something. I just need to touch you. You should come with me. And he started rambling. I just felt terror. I couldn't even speak. I grabbed my friend's hand and turned. We sprinted the rest of the way to the cafe. And as soon as we were inside, we asked to use the phone. I called my mum to pick us up while my friend told the worker what happened. And that guy looked like a month later, I received my first cell phone. This happened when I was an 11 year old boy visiting a movie theater with my family. I remember I was 11 because I had to lie about my age in order to get into the movie, which was a PG 13. It was a long movie. And by the time it had finished, we had all become rather hungry. And so decided instead of going straight home, would grab something to eat. We jumped into our family Land Rover and headed just a couple of minutes down the road to where several fast food places were located. As was often the case, an argument ensued about which fast food restaurant we would purchase our food from. My family preferred KFC and me only liking Burger King. In the end to settle the argument, my father gave me some money and told me to go and get a Burger King while the rest of my family got their KFC. Delicious. The two shops were so close together after all. Entering the shop, which was completely empty for the most part, I approached the counter and ordered my usual order of burger and fries and took my favorite seat near the window. It was at that point I noticed a man in his mid 40s to late 30s who was looking my way. As soon as our eyes made contact, he said hi and made his way over to me, placing himself in the seat across the table from where I was. Uh, hello, I replied not wanting to be impolite, but wondering what this was about. People where I live are normally very private and a shy 11 year old who wasn't used to strangers approaching him. This was a bit out of the ordinary. I was just beginning to wonder why a man of his age would be interested in speaking to someone like me. When he said, Don't worry, kid, I ain't no weirdo. Huh? <laughs> no, I wouldn't think that I replied, as I felt my face reddening. And then I felt very shy and awkward. The conversation flowed out of him for the next few minutes, asking me questions such as is that your favorite food? Do you like cars? What are your thoughts on wrestling? Typical kind of things you might say to coax a child into feeling comfortable with you. And it sort of worked. My answers gradually becoming less short and forced as my confidence grew. He then abruptly stood up to excuse himself, only to return moments later with a milkshake from the place next door. This is for you, he said, as he placed it on the table. Surprised, I thanked him. I looked up and said, you went next door. Did you see my dad? A frightened look came over the man's face. What? This confused me. My family are eating right next door. Didn't you see them? I described my siblings and parents to him. So he knew he would have seen them. Upon receiving this information, the man's eyes became glued to the door of the restaurant. He slowly rose once more. I need to use the bathroom, he muttered, and almost backed into it. Okay, I replied, completely unnerved by this sudden change in body language. This next part all happened very quickly. It started with my becoming faintly aware of the police sirens in the distance, except they were no longer so far in the distance. In fact, the sound of them and the tires skidding to a halt were right outside the door. Then there were men shouting. They were right in the parking lot. I noticed the woman behind the counter trying to get my attention with some hand gestures, and it appeared she was motioning me to remain still. At this point, I was terrified. I didn't want to be involved in whatever was about to happen. Seconds later, the door flew open and police armed with handguns filed into the room. Living in England, I had never seen a gun before and I was beside myself and began shaking and crying. Upon noticing me, the officers nearest holstered their weapons and crouched down next to me, 
asking me to first remain calm, immediately followed by, did he give you anything to drink? Did you drink anything? My eyes told him what my mouth was too scared to say, and looked towards the drink positioned next to my food. The senior officer beckoned for another officer who picked up the drink, wrapped it in a plastic bag and carried it away upright, being careful not to spill it. The same question again and again, did you drink any? Each time I replied, no, as I had been so weirded out by the man's sudden change in behavior at hearing about me not being here all alone. I had still felt too strange to eat or drink anything before the police arrived. After a search of the premises yielding only an open bathroom window through which the man had made his escape, eventually my parents were allowed in, but only to ask me the same question. Eventually the police and my parents believed there was no need for a stomach pump, although after learning of the man's history, they had more than enough reason to be worried. It turns out, this man would often befriend young boys in fast food places and skate parks up and down the country, and then offer them a drink, laced with crushed sleeping tablets, take them into his car, drive them out into the woods, and, you know, do bad things. So heavy was the dose of sleeping tablets, and so far away was medical help, that often the boys never woke up and died in their comatose states. I tried not to spend too much time thinking about how it could have happened to me, and I hoped they caught the guy shortly afterwards. It had been the woman working behind the counter who phoned the police after becoming concerned, and the police had been looking for this man for quite some time and rushed to the scene upon getting a matched description. I never got the chance to thank her. To think it could have been the last time I ever saw my family, and to this day, we now always use the drive through instead. This happened when I was 17. I'm 24 now. And all started with a road trip my classroom did in high school. I don't really remember where, but it was a three day trip. And I was carrying a big backpack with a lot of unnecessary souvenirs and clothes. So it was super heavy. We were coming back in the bus and my mum called me to say she was with my father. When we were reaching the city I live in, the teacher told us that the driver could let us get off the bus if we were close to our homes, so that we didn't have to go all the way to school. We were reaching a part of the city I thought was close to my father's house, where I thought my mum was, so I asked the driver to stop and off I went. It was only when the bus was gone that I realized I was wrong and didn't know this part of the city and my phone battery was dying. I called my mum asking her if she could pick me up, but she told me she was in a restaurant across the city because she thought she would pick me up near my school. I didn't want to admit it, but I was scared and lost. So my reckless and very stupid young brain told her to wait there and that I would walk to a nearby subway or bus station and go to the restaurant, even though I had no idea where I was. So I started walking. I was lost, tired, and my back was in pain because of the heavy backpack I was carrying and started walking slower. My phone was dead, the city was darker, and I reached a part of the city that was not a good neighborhood. I was scared and in an empty street, but I was still thinking I could reach a subway or something and be safe. When suddenly I felt someone pulling my backpack and pulling me inside an old building. I was scared and paralyzed with fear until this man grabbed my hand and I realized he wanted to pull me all the way inside. I still don't know how I did it, but I jumped getting my hand out of his reach and pushed him with my backpack and used it to get my arms out of the bag and ran and ran, crying and trying to find help. I'm not sure if the guy followed me or not, but I ran until I felt like I was gonna pass out and reached a big avenue. Just then I turned around and the guy wasn't there, and I felt momentarily relieved, only to remember that I didn't have my bag with me and was still lost, but now without money or a cell phone or anything for that matter. I asked a woman if she knew where the nearest subway was, and I think she saw how desperate I looked 
because she accompanied me all the way there and was kind enough to buy me a ticket after I explained to her what happened. When I arrived to where my mum was, she was super scared and wanted to call the police, but I wasn't able to tell her where exactly all of this went down. I don't want to think about what could have happened if I hadn't have been able to escape. I need to give you some background before I begin. I'm from a city in the northeast of Scotland in the UK. What happened here didn't just affect me, but also two close friends called Debbie and Joe. We all used to work for Virgin Megastore. I started there back in 2003, and Debbie joined in 2006, and Joe in 2007. The entire staff of the store, for the best part, were all close friends. We were all music and movie nerds, so shared the same interests and sense of humour. Every year over the Christmas period, we would take on temporary staff as extra help for the volume of customers we would get at the time of year. In 2007, one of our temps was Rory. Most of us hit it off with him brilliantly. Young guy seemed really passionate about music, especially Pink Floyd, which he was a big fan of, especially with Joe, who was one of the greatest guitarists I've ever met, and myself who grew up on Pink Floyd through my parents. Plus, Rory was a budding filmmaker, and his love of movies seemed to match his love of music, so we would have a lot to chat about, and became friends very quickly. It was rare to keep in touch with the work temps post the Christmas period, but Rory was an exception. He didn't live in the same city as the rest of us, but kept plenty of contact through text and social media, and would come through the city to hang out from time to time. Move forward to Christmas 2008. By this point, Virgin Megastore had become Zavi Entertainment, and Rory came back to work with us as a temp, in particular with me. I ran the stockroom in the store, which was the busiest place at Christmas time, and had a history of not great people for help. So I was happy to be getting someone I knew would work hard, and that I could have banter with. He could be a bit annoying trying to force different live versions of the same Pink Floyd song he found on the internet. As I said, I love Pink Floyd, but I love a lot of music too. Nevertheless, I figured eh, he's young and passionate, but he's cool. Around this time, he started to put together a self-made Pink Floyd documentary, which he interviewed me and Joe for. And to be honest, he did a really great job given the limitation and tools he had. Zabi closed in February 2009, due to the global credit crunch at the time. All Zavi staff and Rory kept in touch. We'd all become very close working there, like I said. Fast forward to summer 2010. We had a Zavi reunion night out, which Rory organised. Most of us that still lived in the same city managed to make it along. Joe had moved to Glasgow at this point, and it was a really fun night out, and Rory stayed at my place. I should also point out, Rory was preparing to go to America for his second year working as a camp counsellor for Camp America, at Camp Wigwam in Maine, Ohio. Since Zavi closed, I'd gotten a new job doing the same thing at another entertainment retail store, and that Christmas, Rory came to work there as a temp, which I was initially fine with. Moving into 2011, and Rory starts to raise red flags, although at the time I didn't see it clearly. He claimed that while in America, he'd gotten a job helping with editing and camera work on the show Burn Notice. At the time I was like, oh wow man, that's cool, well done. It didn't seem unbelievable, given I knew he had a talent in filmmaking. To coincide with this, he claimed he was working for Camp America in Florida, which is what led him to be working on Burn Notice, where it was filmed at the time. Then, when he was back in Scotland in 2011, it was time for another work Zavi reunion, which Rory had to be in charge of, which bothered me since he technically didn't work there when we closed. 
and like I said, he was only a temp. I got sickened with him posting constantly on Facebook about essentially what was just some old friends going to the pub. Again, I was like, yeah, he's young and easily excited, but harmless though. Then another red flag was raised. Rory and another friend who shared an interest in filmmaking were talking about doing a film in the city. They spent the whole day looking for a location, and afterwards, when I spoke to Rory, he was like, yeah, we're gonna go do this and this, making it sound like they had some exciting ideas. Then when I spoke to my other friend about it, he said, all Rory did for the whole day was ask me what my favorite directors were. It was a complete waste of time. Made me think, hmm, he's young and excitable, but has a tendency to exaggerate. Move into 2012, Debbie, who I mentioned earlier, became a close figure in his life. Debbie is nearly six foot tall, a blonde bombshell, and at the time, one of the nicest people you could ever meet, with an amazing sense of humor. We became super close when we worked together, but it was always totally platonic. I always looked at her in more of a sibling way. She would come around to my place for dinner and to watch movies, and I knew all of her close friends and a few family members. Herself and Rory went to the cinema a few times and hung out afterwards. Absolutely nothing wrong with that, for now. Move on to Christmas. Rory's back as a temp for the third year in the row, and by this time, he has started to annoy the other staff. While on lunch, he'd sit and brag about all the TV shows he worked on during his summer in the States. Burn Notice, Criminal Minds, and The Wire. Unfortunately, I didn't hear about it this time because people knew I was friendly with him, so they didn't want to seem like they were talking crap about him. As the staff in this job also got along famously. On a personal note, talking with him at work became a bit weird. He started to talk to me in a really smug and condescending tone, which given I'm six years older than the dude and had a hand in him getting him his temp jobs every year, and me thinking I was his friend, didn't appreciate it. Then around the same time, there's another Zavi Knight out to you. Rory, Debbie, and Joe, who was visiting from Glasgow, myself, and a few others. The day before I said, get together, keep in mind I'm already pissed about how Rory is behaving. I get a text from him saying how, hey man, the plan for the night out tomorrow is to go to a pub quiz, your favorite. Now, I don't go to pub quizzes for tedious personal reasons. All of these friends know this, so Rory was essentially implying the rest of the guys had planned to go to something I wouldn't go to. Which I didn't, as I was super pissed about that text. I kept quiet about it from the others, even though I should have just shown how devious he was, because as it turns out, those guys didn't do a pub quiz, and there was no intention to. The next day comes, and Joe comes into the shop to speak with me, since I'd missed the night out. The whole time I'm talking to him, Rory is standing there in a defensive stance, answering everything I ask Joe. Like he was his spokesperson, which was infuriating, because I was at work. I couldn't let him get under my skin, and Joe is happy-go-lucky and didn't even notice what Rory was doing. Rory was obsessed with Joe because of his talents as a guitar player, to the point of becoming unhealthy. It was around the time that Debbie started to sense I was having a problem with Rory, and it was true. Contact with him would trigger me to get anxious or angry, because I knew there was something amiss, but Debbie and Joe were constantly fooled by his fool's charm. And that's why I kept tolerating him, because I loved those guys, and didn't want to be the cause of any unnecessary drama in the workplace. In early 2013, Rory makes out that his dad had a life-threatening stroke, which he survives, but leaves him incredibly disabled. This subsequently turns out to be a lie and a tool to get sympathy from Joe and Debbie. Moving forward to 2014, Joe moves back to town from Glasgow into Debbie's spare room, and this is where Rory really starts to phase me out of the group. Despite having recently hung out with me, and me having put up with him at my place, which I've done several times over the years at this point, he takes Debbie, Joe, and another ex zabby friend to three different price gigs all around the country. 
Initially, I was super pissed, but in hindsight, I was relieved. It was Rory that paid for all the tickets for those gigs, which was another red flag. Have to point out that, for when he wasn't working with me as a temp over Christmas or in America over the summer, working for Camp America and various TV shows. He was making out that he was a freelance photographer and video editor, which would be fine, but he didn't have a website, Facebook page or anything else as far as anyone could see to contact him and do work. Taking that into account, and the fact that he's throwing cash to go to concerts around the UK, I started to grow suspicious as about where his money was coming from. Following the Prince gigs, I had blocked him on social media, as his posts and comments on other people's posts were just annoying, constantly undermining people on what they're saying and arguing with folks having different opinions to him. Debbie took issue with me blocking him and stuck up for him, which, in hindsight, she'd been groomed by him and had rose-tinted glasses on when looking at him. I caved and got back in touch with him, even though I now know I should have walked away from them all. But like I said before, I dearly loved Debbie and Joe, and didn't want to lose their friendship, despite everything I knew and had seen. Throughout 2014, Debbie and Rory got super close. Anyone that didn't know them seeing Facebook pics would think they were a couple. Over the next two years, my contact with these guys started to drift. Rory would come to my place for a bit, and then would be like, well, I'm away up to darling Debbie's, I would invite you, but you're not one of the three amigos. A lot of the time, he wasn't actually going there, it would turn out. He would come to my place to stay the night once, saying he needed to catch a flight to the States in the morning to get a video editing job. Then it would turn out he was just going back to the village he lived in at his mum's house. Eventually, I walked away quietly. I took Debbie, Joe and Rory off newsfeed and hid any Facebook posts I made hidden from them. I figured if I'd see them on the street, I'd be polite, but I just tried to get away from them ASAP. Figuratively, trying to close the chapter of the book. I then started to investigate Rory's claims about his time in America. I relayed them all to a friend and his flatmate who himself had lived in America for a long time. They both told me, nah man, there's no way he could be doing all that. Which is true. If you go to America to work for Camp America, that's all you're allowed to do. And with a bit of research, I found the camp Rory actually worked at, providing he never did Camp America work in Florida. During this time, I had friends who would still follow him on Facebook out of intrigue. They would ask me, where is his money coming from? Rory was going to stadium and arena concerts around the UK at least once a week. Some of those gigs costing as much as £200 a ticket, not to mention travel costs and accommodation. I knew something was up. I knew he wasn't involved in drugs. He would claim he'd made money from YouTube, but his channel barely had any subscribers and all his videos were copyrighted material, so there's no way he could make anything on that. I did wonder if he was making money from editing. He was avoiding paying tax, that's for sure. Believe me, if I could have afforded a private investigator, I would have definitely asked him to check out this guy. During all this time, Debbie and Joe were just hanging out and posting how great he is on Facebook. Despite the fact I found Rory had a second Facebook account where the profile pic was of him and Debbie. This was a secret account. And I took a screenshot and showed Debbie, but she's just like, oh, that's his American account. Mm-hmm. Fast forward to October 2018. By this point, I've severed contact with Rory completely. Missed Debbie's wedding the previous year where Rory was bridesman and haven't seen Joe in a good while either. I'm back at work after lunch for about five minutes. Then my friend who was on her lunch and in the staff room comes running through to where I am. Hey, have you heard that Rory was in court? Which in itself was totally shocking. I was like, what? For tax evasion or copyright infringement? No, for making videos of little kids. Between January and November 2017, he was pretending to be a girl online using YouTube and Omegle to groom young boys. Once I was told what he'd done, I was in an adrenaline-fueled rage for the next 17 hours. 
just so pissed off that I'd been right that he was a bad guy but couldn't prove it. I knew my friends had been duped. Not to mention all those poor, poor kids. As for his expendable income, I really think he was selling the videos that he was making on the dark web for Bitcoin profit. He was the first person to ever mention the dark net to me, but in a way of like, oh, never go on the dark net. He pleaded guilty, got three years and nine months, along with five years harm and prevention order, and will be on the offenders register for the rest of his life. Thanks for listening. I'm still in touch with Joe, although he's super busy these days. I'm not in touch with Debbie anymore, sadly. I know she was mortified by the revelations, but she's married and happy, so I'm glad she just saw the truth eventually, even though it took something so heinous for her to see it. I was 16 at a house party with a good friend, another girl. There were some gate crashers who turned up, which isn't unusual at London house parties, but these guys were older and there was just a vibe. A girl I vaguely know who was drunk and being surrounded by them, and I asked her if she was okay, and she told me to piss off. I looked at my friend and said, I'm gonna call my mum and dad to get me. Do you wanna lift? My parents were amazing and said to me that if I was at a party or out for any reason and didn't want to be there, I would call them and they'd always come to get me. My parents turned up, coats on over pajamas and took us both home. Apparently half hour after we left, someone was stabbed. The girl we had asked earlier was assaulted and lots of stuff was stolen and people were beaten up and held up at knife point. I had such a feeling in the air that I've hardly felt before or since and knew that we shouldn't be there. I visited Paris a few years back with a friend. We're both females in our 20s at the time. And we went for lunch at a restaurant and met some guy who presented himself as the owner of the place. While asking how the lunch was, he asked about our nationality, as it was easily understandable that we're not French. He then proceeded to tell us one of his best friends is from where we're from and was thrilled to let him know. Some girls from the same country were eating at his restaurant. He called this friend and passed his phone to me to talk to him. Nothing weird, usual stuff. And at the end, he invited us to a party with live music, drinks and stuff. We thought, why not? We didn't have plans for the evening, so we exchanged numbers and agreed to meet. My friend and I went to meet him at the address he gave us, which was at some abandoned place, no movement around. We got this scary vibe while waiting for him to show up. A car approaches us. It's him, a man in his 50s. He was very polite and apologized to us for waiting and tells us that we're not very far from the place. We get into his car, very afraid, but not wanting to show and act like everything's cool. We didn't know where we were going. He was telling us about his life, how he's been living in France for over 30 years and how he missed our country so much but work didn't allow him to take vacation, so he hasn't visited in years. He seemed normal, but my friend and I knew we messed up and it was too late. We couldn't even talk about how to get out of the situation. My friend was freaking out, so I told her to please stay calm. We arrive at this building, it's dark outside and we could see no party here. He apologized once again saying the party was canceled, but some of his friends are inside and that we could have some drinks, talk a little, and he'll drive us to the hotel later. At this point, I'd tell him we'd prefer to go back to our hotel and ask if it's possible to just drop us off at the nearest bus station. He insists that he really wants to spend some time just chatting with us and wants to order some drinks to make up for the party being canceled. I tried to act as cool as possible, not wanting to offend him because I didn't know how he'd react. He kept begging for us to go inside and maybe cook something for us because I told him we were hungry. Hopefully he would agree to drive us to the hotel. It was 11 p.m. and we gave him a false hotel address, of course. I felt so relieved when I saw city lights again and we were out of his car. To this day, I can't believe how naive we were and fortunate 
that nothing happened. This happened when I was in middle school. It was summer, and I was taking a break from riding my bike around my neighborhood, outside a friend's house, when I saw this red pickup truck with a bronze stripe pull over to a stop near me. The passenger and driver were both white males with sandy blonde hair and white tank tops and baseball caps. They claimed to be lost and looking for directions to somewhere. But since I didn't know, I said, sorry, can't help you. The entire time, alarm bells are going off in my head, and I move farther away from the truck and into my friend's yard, hoping she and her mother would come home. They kept wanting me to help them and monitoring me to come closer to the vehicle. I just kept repeating I didn't know where it was as I continued to back up into the yard. Eventually they gave up and left, and once I could no longer see their truck, I pedaled back home as fast as I could. There was another occasion something creepy happened. I was followed home from the supermarket by a dark green pickup truck. Once I came to a stop at my house, which I know is a bad move, but I figured I was being paranoid. He pulled up behind me and motioned for me to get out of my car. I didn't and stayed there. The guy started talking to me and asking me questions about my license plate. Apparently, it was very similar to a club he belonged to, which turned out to be some sort of uber conservative militia. He finally left and I didn't leave my car until I was sure he was gone. My parents and cousin were upset that I didn't call the cops about being followed. So was I, but I didn't want to call them on a false alarm. And for the next few days, I kept my eyes open for the truck. And to this day, I'm still paranoid sometimes about someone following me home from the supermarket. I was 15 at the time. I took about 10 of my little cousins with me to the park. Three of my older cousins, but still younger than me or the same age, came to help me. As I approached the park, there was a man and two other kids there. He came up to me and started talking to me. I tried to give him the hint that I didn't want to talk, but he kept on going. Oh, did you bring your kids with you? He nods and kept talking. Then asked me weird questions like, are you married? Are those your kids? How old are you? I lied about my name and age and tried to walk away. Then he said, I like you. Want to sit and talk? I said I had something important to tell my family first and that I'd join him after. I smiled and went up to one of my older cousins and said, pretend everything's okay, but we need to go now. She nodded and I watched as the two kids left without the man. So he started walking home again and I made sure he didn't follow a watch where we went. I later found out he had picked up one of my little cousins and put him down again. And one of my cousins saw, but she froze and didn't say anything to me. Luckily, one of us saw him walk into a house, so we called the police. They went into the house and found him. They couldn't charge him with anything, but told us that they've received several complaints from him before. Something I left out was that I've seen him at the park previously. I would go there with my boyfriend to hang out, and one time he was there just staring at me. He didn't approach us or say anything to me. I'm assuming it's because my boyfriend was with me, but I really hope to certainly not meet him again. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's stories. We certainly had a dark collection going on today. If you did like it, please don't forget to let me know down below. As always, I'd like to give a huge thank you to my wonderful patrons whose continued support really does help keep this channel growing. So if you'd like to support a little bit every month with prizes for doing so, you can find the information in the description. Don't forget that if bad things have happened to you and you'd like to share them with the rest of the world, you could also send it to my email or post it on my Reddit and it might be used in a future installment if You've used enough detail and other stuff. All right then guys, for now I'm gonna sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.